A lot of people think that since they see pictures of dead politicians on their money that it's always been produced by government and that's the only way it can be, but I'll talk about the history of uh, privately issued money because actually the first coins we know about were issued by private merchants who wanted to improve the purity and the consistency uh, of the pieces of metal that people were trading with. And similarly, this first paper money, the first banknotes, were introduced by private bankers who were actually offering an improvement. At that point, in medieval Italy, the coinage function had been taken over by governments. And it had been taken over not to improve the quality, but actually the reverse, in order to tax the currency by debasing it, by squeezing the silver out of it and making cheaper and cheaper coins so to profit the princes. Uh, the private bankers came in and offered money that was denominated in pure units of silver and made it transferable through bank accounts so merchants didn't have to worry about handling big bags of coins whose quality was unreliable. And of course, paper notes became a much more portable, much more convenient substitute for lugging around big bags of coins. Uh, and so it's been private enterprise that's improved the quality of money and made it easier to transfer money. There was a period in which, the, uh, the period of the international gold standard, in which the basic money uh, traded internationally consisted of gold and silver coins, some places uh, monopolized by government, but the governments had to compete, at least in the international market. And so the money was reliable. Uh, the gold standard didn't rely on any one government. One government could leave the gold standard, but the other countries would continue. So the international gold standard would continue to operate. Uh, it didn't rely on the trustworthiness of any particular government. And that made it possible to have an international standard that people could trust, because nobody was in a position to debase it. But in the First World War, between 1914 and 1918, the governments of Europe all went off the gold standard, started issuing paper money in vast quantities, and the gold standard never really recovered. And since then, we've had the problem of unrestricted government issue of money, which has given us bouts of high inflation, hyperinflation in some countries, chronic inflation in other countries. And one of the best hopes we have for reintroducing reliable money would be to try to find a way to return competition and contract and trustworthiness to the monetary system. One possibility would be to return to a gold or a silver standard. There's not a lot of support for that, but there is still, yet, <laughs> there is still a lot of gold sitting around in government vaults. So it's not like we would have to dig up a lot of gold to return to a gold standard. We just have to liberate the gold that's already being held by central banks. Uh, another possibility is the new technology known as cryptocurrency. So gold and silver worked by privately issued money being redeemable. That is, the bank would promise to buy back your banknote for a fixed sum in gold or silver, so many ounces of gold or so many ounces of silver. So it was a price guarantee, you might say. Bitcoin works in an entirely different way. It has a quantity guarantee. There's a program that generates the number of Bitcoins out into the future. And anyone can view the program. It's open source. Anyone can inspect it. Uh, anyone can look at the chain of transactions that's already been logged. And so it's verifiable in that way. But Bitcoin works by guaranteeing that only so many Bitcoins will be issued at any point in time. And that way people can rely on it not to hyperinflate. There isn't anybody who controls the quantity. It's controlled by this program. The problem with Bitcoin is that, uh, therefore, when the demand goes up and down, the value goes up and down because the quantity is predetermined. And that works against it being widely adopted as a medium of exchange. So if we don't go back to a commodity standard and if we uh, face this difficulty to have uh, cryptocurrencies more widely adopted because of the variability of their value, uh, 
uh, we're left with trying to figure out a way to control the issue of money by central banks. So that's the, the challenge of our time to derive, uh, sorry, to devise or invent, to write down some kind of constraint that will give people some trustworthiness. Uh, the last great experiment in writing a constitution for a fiat money was the European Central Bank Constitution. Uh, it was basically written by the Germans who said, we're not going to participate unless we get a guarantee that the one goal of the European Central Bank will be price stability, because maintain the value of the euro. And we put that in the Constitution. And one of the first acts and bylaws adopted by the European Central Bank was to define price stability as inflation less than 2%. And that was the rule, and it was a very solid currency. It quickly rose to a premium over the US dollar. But now that constitution is not being obeyed. The European Central Bank is not just fixing on the goal of maintaining the value of the money. They're trying to rescue Greece. They're trying to backstop the banking system. They're taking on all kinds of missions that uh, run into conflict with the original mission. Uh, so that's a disappointment. Uh, and that makes me think that we can't really rely on governments to maintain their promises. We need some kind of contractual mechanism, some kind of private mechanism where if the issuer of money doesn't live up to the contract, they can be taken to a court of law. And we should have a monetary standard whose value doesn't rely on one big actor continuing to play by the rules that that actor has set, that is the central bank. We shouldn't have to rely on central banks. Now, to get away from them, as I said, we need to make a transition to some other kind of money. In the meantime, it seems to me important that we defend the principle that people have the freedom to choose whatever currency they want to use among those that are available. So people in any country should be free to use the money issued in any other country. People should be free to use gold or silver. People should be free to use Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. One of the most interesting experiences with a private banking system, or free banking system, I like to call it, I mean, that's what its proponents called it, by contrast to a centralized banking system, a free banking system, meaning free entry, free competition, no artificial legal restrictions on the kinds of contracts banks can make with their customers, no monopoly privileges for one bank of issue, which was the historical origin of central banks. One of the best cases we have of that kind of system operating was in Scotland. Uh, this is what I've done research on, uh, studied for the last 30 years, where anybody could start a bank, anybody who would accept responsibility. So the, the bankers had what lawyers call unlimited liability for the debts created by the banking company, which meant that if they didn't pay back their note holders or didn't pay back their depositors, all the property of the shareholders in the bank was uh, now the property of the debtors of the bank, of the note holders and the depositors of the bank. I should say the creditors of the bank. That made banks behave very prudently, very responsibly. It meant that if a bank was starting to become unprofitable, unlike today, the owners in, under that system did not have a reason to say, well, time to start taking crazy risks because we can't lose any more. That's the problem with the system we have today. But under unlimited liability, the owners say, let's close the bank and pay everybody and just wind up the business because we don't want to pile up more and more obligations. Uh, so in the Scottish system, there were more than two dozen banks issuing banknotes. They were all redeemable in the silver pound sterling. Uh, all the notes of different banks traded against one another at one to one at, at par value at 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, well, the pound, 240 shillings in the pound. They weren't floating exchange rates between banks. It was a unified monetary system. So banks would accept notes issued by other banks. They would accept checks written on other banks. They would get together and exchange these obligations at, at the clearinghouse. Uh, and that provided a regular system of discipline to keep any bank from issuing more money than its customers wanted to hold. So no bank was in a position to overissue. 
And the system regulated itself. It regulated the quantity of money uh, through this competitive mechanism, not through any plan from the center, not through any artificial rule fastened on a political institution, but through this market mechanism. People who had more money than they wanted could take it back to the bank and turn it in for gold or silver. And the system as a whole was pinned down by the international gold standard. If all the banks together sh uh, would issue too much money, or more likely, if for some reason people in Scotland wanted to hold less money, uh, money would flow out of the system and that would compel the banks to pull back on the amount they had in circulation. So it was a nicely self-regulating system. And people who saw that, uh, saw that it worked well, argued that it ought to be the system adopted in throughout Great Britain. So England was a separate country at that time. They had different rules about banking. In England, they had given a monopoly to the Bank of England. But people who saw how well the Scottish system worked said, we should have competition in London as well. And there was a, a, a movement to do that, to introduce free banking into London. But the Bank of England managed through political mechanisms to stop that from happening. So they eventually took control over the banking system in Scotland and brought the free banking system to an end. But that was an inspiration for a lot of reformers in the 19th century to introduce Scottish-style banking systems around the world. And there were more than 60 places in the world in the 19th century where you had competition among different private issuers of currency. Uh, and it worked wherever people would, wherever the government would let it work, wherever competition was allowed, no privileges given to special banks. If free banking was so good, why didn't it last? It didn't last because governments wanted the revenue available from having a monopoly on issuing currency, just like private coinage didn't last because governments wanted the revenue available from having a monopoly on the mint. So it was really a fiscal story uh, in most places. And so that's led us into our current system where we have to hope and wish that our government won't ruin the currency. But some governments have been very poorly behaved. And even in countries where the government has been relatively well behaved, and I would count the United States as one of those, we've had periods of double digit inflation. And there's no guarantee that we won't have them again. Uh, it's true that central banks have been more responsible in the last 15 years than they were before, but there's nothing to guarantee that when they find themselves deeply in debt, they won't want to just print the money to pay back the debts and then uh, ruin the currency.